Welcome to the Legit Chicks Podcast with Phyllis, Elise, and Rhonda. They are three seasoned professional women living a very human experience, and they're here to drop the 411, spill the tea, and otherwise keep it legit. Welcome to the Legit Chicks Podcast. I'm Phyllis. I'm Elise. And I'm Rhonda. Well, we're happy to be here again tonight, and in a little bit, we have Jonathan Looney coming up from O'Looney's Liquor Store, and we're going to have some whiskey, right, girls? So yeah, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to that, but first, let's catch up on the week. Um, you know, it, for me, it was uh, it was pretty crazy. We had Chocolate Fantasy Ball, which we talked about on our last episode, and um, it, the event, even though it was virtual, turned out fantastically. There were so many people that tuned in that night, watched live. We had like over 750 views. We had over 400 comments. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. The feedback we received was tremendous. We not only exceeded the budget, but we exceeded the goal for the stretch goal for the night. So I'm so very thrilled um, because it just helps the families continue to stay in the house. So if anybody listening helped contribute to that, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was an amazing uh, time. And, you know, it's just it's just great for the organization. And probably needed more than ever during this winter storm. Right. (laughs) No Mageddon you guys are having. Oh my oh, God. Yes. Yeah. So a pandemic's not bad enough, right? Now we have a blizzard. <laughs> yeah. It's it's never been this cold here. And as long as I can remember our hot water heater sprung a leak. We found out our attic wasn't insulated. All my extra towels are stuffed under the eaves trying to keep the heat in. This is crazy. Uh, oh my gosh. Well, and we have a a a bathroom upstairs that has an outside wall that wasn't insulated properly so we had a leak and it started coming out through a um one of the detection devices in the dining room for window breakage on the alarm so it just starts pouring out from the ceiling which is crazy so that i can talk about the weather i've had here in scottsdale arizona yes rhonda you can keep that Uh, or send it down here it'll melt the snow. I wish I could I wish I could actually scoop all of you up and bring you out here um, yeah, been, but no I have been um, before this happened well and oh my goodness all of our thoughts and prayers and and concerns are going out to those in Arkansas Texas Oklahoma wherever without power it's it's crazy what I've been reading out here it just doesn't seem possible what you guys are going through and what Texas is going through so really um our thoughts go out it's just it's crazy thank you I feel real lucky we've not lost power we didn't really have a water incident it was just a minor annoyance I feel really blessed yeah that's good that's yeah, keeping power is key because if right. you got heat, the rest of it is will be fine. Right, <laughs> the rest of it will be fine. I know. So, but those without heat, you're right, Rhonda. I mean, if these temperatures are, you know, they're they're health threatening. I mean, people mm-hmm. are dying from from the cold because it's so horrible. Well, um, the three of us have a mutual friend uh, who's a fabulous massage therapist mm-hmm. talk yes, about it sometime is. on this uh and his his i guess he lives in a duplex or something and the other tenant moved out and the gas company shut off the gas like talked about and so he's been without he, he he has one of those guns that does the therm, thermom a temperature check and it's been 30 something degrees in his apartment and um oh so I've been trying to check on him all week. I think he's been very cold. So that's still not fixed? I don't think so. I don't oh, know. Today he was out walking in the snow. He posted something on Instagram. He was out walking in the snow with his dog. So I'm thinking everything's okay. But it might have been warmer outside in the snow. <laughs> yeah, it might be. Again. Good gracious. Bless his mm. heart. So other than chocolate fantasy ball and snow again, what have you guys been up to? So I had a deadline on an article I was supposed to write uh, for a a national magazine. They invited me to write this article for them. I sent it to them today and they send me back a contract 
that makes me legally responsible for anything that happens relative to that article. And I'm just going, why didn't you tell me this before? I would have saved myself some time and not written it. We're going to yeah. fix that. Yeah. We're going fi- to we're gonna fix that after the podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is frustrating. And I, I do not believe they should have allowed you to submit that article without ever having discussed the fact that they were going to request a contract. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't like when larger companies take ad- advantage of individuals and putting all of these, you know, what are standard contract terms that an individual is not going to have the kind of insurance coverage uh, exactly. and things they need to agree to those. So we'll, we'll fix it. I promise. I, I know you will. <laughs> But good for you for writing an article. And I know you've also been asked to go out to uh, somewhere fun. Yeah, Vegas. Because Phyllis and I are like, we're going to try to, I don't know, hop on. Y'all going to come with me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I reached out to the person who invited me to speak at that conference today and said, hey, if you've got a contract, I want to see it now because I'm not booking flights until till we see what you're trying to hold me to. Yeah. That's it looks like when I got today, I'm probably not going. Well, well that's we'll, an I did. It may not be that same scenario. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Well, um, as, as you both know, I had to have another little procedure last week. It's just been so much fun. And I... Um, got so mad at the anesthesiologist and and had now my mask triggers me because I had to go um they didn't ask me to do any type of COVID check before the procedure which I didn't think about now that I'm vaccinated there's there's been like a little mental switch or something in my mind and I just didn't even think about it I took my vaccination card with me and um they were putting in the IV and and there was a family nurse practitioner in training who came in and was learning how to consent Mm -hmm. and doing of it. She was great. And and we established a great rapport. And then the anesthesiologist comes in and the mood immediately switches. He clearly intimidates her. She got nervous to the point that she didn't think she could put the IV in my arm to which and and then they wanted to put it on the back of my hand, which I'm here like trying not to because I don't know. Um, and so they get it in he drops his glasses in a notepad on top of the ivy site Uh -uh. and and then she starts flushing and he says which I'm like what what are you what is wrong with you man he says you're not doing that right and I'm over here and then I feel this burn going up through my my arm I let out an expletive which didn't help anybody's situation right but it hurt and I was stressed so then they are taking me back to the procedure room and I've had my mask on the whole time and it's a cloth heavy it's one of those Headley and Bennett very thick mask Mm -hmm. and I put a filter inside of it and they're getting ready I see the oxygen mask coming down on me and I'm like wait, 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 take, take my mask off. And they're like, no, no, we're going to just put it on top of your mask. No. Yes. And I was like, no, my brain won't get off. <laughs> I don't think is scientifically correct, but, I, but it was just very stressful. And, and then he says to the girl and me, oh God, she's not one of those that's claustrophobic. Is she? Oh, no and the little girl she oh said well she told us that she has panic disorder which is true I, I did and he's like well just don't put it on her yet I'm gonna knock her out quick and I'm hearing all this and I remember it um so I I came out of there I've been mad ever since and I I, I didn't have a reaction to the anesthesia for a couple of days um but I just I, now I'm triggered by my own mask not really but no. It was a, a horrible experience and I clearly haven't gotten over it yet. It's been a week ago today and I'm still mad about it. So that's my no reason. Doubt. <laughs> hmm. But Man. find out if you're going to go in for a procedure, don't do what I did and don't do your, you know, I did do my research, find out how they're going to handle the mask situation. Right. So you're prepared. Yes. Yeah, so you're prepared. You know, and I think it should be in your rights to tell them what, 
they can and cannot do. This is all about you, not their convenience. <laughs> Well, it just didn't, it, you know, and I work for pediatric health system. So kids are treated much differently. And that's kind of in my mindset all the time. And I just, it didn't enter my mind. Um, who yeah. knows if my brain was affected or not by the lack of oxygen, but I may use that excuse for some things for a while. <laughs> oh, that's pretty oh handy. Gosh. Well, when I had meniscus surgery a while back, they took, they had me after I got in and got the gown on and all that, they said, okay, you can take your mask off, but everybody else had to keep theirs on. So when Johnny came back, he had to have his on, all the nurses did, but I was like mask free. And I thought this is just seems so weird before they actually take me in and put me under, you would think they would leave it on until you got back there, but Goodness, we're drinking whiskey tonight, girl. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> that might fix lots of things. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining the Legit Chicks tonight. Thank you so much for having me. On. This is so awesome. And so, Jonathan, tell us a little bit about, you know, we met at Vistage and, um, you know, look, we want to just first introduce how we all met. So we met you there, right? You were in a group. Yeah, indeed. Then you came into our group and uh, it was just a great time. And we've, we've stayed connected ever since, right? I'm, I'm really fortunate to have met all three of you guys there and uh, experienced that bonding that happens in a safe space where people just share what they do in business and personal life and stuff like that. And, and that sort of honesty and accountability is something that I find really important in my life. And so it's fun that I've been able to stay connected to a lot of the folks that I've spent time with in Vistage. And like I said at the beginning, I'm, I count myself extremely fortunate to be invited tonight. So thank you so much. It's so good to see you. We are so excited. So and you fact. are the everyday sommelier, right? Yes, ma'am. You do that all the time. And uh, but you do a lot more than that as well. Sure. So I was uh, born and raised here in Little Rock and uh, worked in specialty retail uh, for an awful lot of years at a couple of outdoor stores where we sold camping equipment. And at one point, I've worked at an outdoor store that specialized in ski gear. And so um, specializing in a category of thing is something that I've done off and on for an awful lot of years. And so, you know, I sold snow ski stuff, I worked at a fly fishing shop. And so that really lent itself uh, back in the year 2000 to when I opened a Looney's, uh, the wine shop that, uh, that we've got um, this year celebrating 21 years in business. So uh, we are official and old enough to buy the booze we sell. So that's, that's perfect. Thanks, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, yeah, we started that up about 21 years ago, and I learned really quick that I needed to spend a bit of time specializing at it, or I could just run the neighborhood liquor store. And what I found was I got a lot more engagement from my guests and my clients and friends as well um, when I uh, spoke with a little bit of authority. Additionally, I opened the shop when I was 20, uh, 27. And so as a, as a pretty young guy uh, with this uh, small specialty wine shop out in a brand new area of town that had only really been around for five, six years, um, I, I found that I was having a lot of interactions with my clients and guests who were considerably older than me. And really, they would just walk in and be like, okay, what's this kid talking about? So I slowly but surely worked around and discovered that some professional education was on the horizon. So went off and became a certified sommelier and all that. And uh, then kind of uh, through my interactions with guests and wine tastings that I conducted with them, ended up uh, discovering that uh, focusing on uh, converting that, um, that uh, the, the wine speak, the sommelier part into everyday parlance or that connection that I get with people when they come in the shop or when I speak to them online or speak to large groups or small groups or in them tastings or something like that, I really discovered that making what could be a really big, heady, difficult to understand thing, making it straightforward and easy to digest became, well, honestly, uh, uh, it was identified at our Vistage group. That, that was one of my superpowers. And so, you know, I embraced <laughs> that and have held on to that and coined the term everyday sommelier, which is not unique to me, but I've made it increasingly unique to me over the last 15 years. 
That's fantastic. That is so great. And you do know your wine. Let me tell you, I mean, I love your wine club. So if anybody wants a wine club, see Jonathan and oh, um, Shamrock Select. It's fantastic. It made me think of another thing. I know you have some single barrel yeah. um, alcohol. And so I tried to get my husband, Johnny, one of your single barrel crowns. Since you mentioned crowns, uh -huh. you were out yeah. of it. So I got the single barrel whistle pig, which I, yeah. So he's, he's saving that for special occasions. So, I mean, I, mean yeah. I almost injured so, my shoulder, pat myself on the back. That was amazing that, that you got a whole single barrel of that because that's a high price whiskey. Or it is, whiskey. it is not inexpensive. And there were only five barrels that came to Arkansas and I was lucky enough oh. to get first crack at it. And so we call our barrel O'Looney's barrel select number one. Um, the result, uh, the, the tough part about that is, although I got to taste it first, all five of them and pick one of them first. So I think mine's better than everybody else, but that's absolutely. Uh, but, but what's yeah. funny about that is they, the penalty of that was instead of getting the barrel in November at the first of the month, when I was told it would arrive, I got it December 23rd. Oh, oh, no. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So they, yeah. they sent me 22 cases on December 23rd. And the result of that was, of course, I said, well, we can, we can do this. And so I, I flash sailed it on, uh, uh, on Facebook and Instagram and overnight we sold 10 cases. Um, <laughs> so that was really great. Cause that was, that was about 50% uh, of what I bought. And so we've trickled it out after that because I really, I need another barrel coming in before we sell out of this one. Um, and we've turned some people onto it and it is not inexpensive, but man, it's lovely. It's a 10 year aged hundred proof product and it smells like marzipan and apple and, Ooh. and, uh, honey and lemon, um, the white stuff, lemon pith. Um, it is just gorgeous. And maybe like some kind of parish, like, do you ever get those boxes like from Harry and David or have you seen these? Yes. Right? These, oh, yeah. these, are the, these are the pairs that are actually, uh, yes. it, I don't remember the, the box chemistry pairs? Term, but, but they're not, yeah, but they're not solid, but they're solid. So you bite into them and they just liquefy and run down your hand. And I can't eat them because they're eating my beard <laughs> in an astonishing way. But like they smell like that skin. But then when you bite in, they're just so juicy. And they, anyway, really, really great stuff. And I'm, I'm fortunate to have a barrel, so. Dang, it's Johnny a, it's Rogers is lucky post. to have some of that. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. We, are, we ought to get you to town, Ron, and, and open know. a bottle. Yeah, yeah, we should. Hey, Jonathan, you talked earlier about how I'm, important. I'm sorry, yes, I'll get to that, but Do we want pour some whiskey. Oh, this you conversation gets better if y'all pour some whiskey. Okay, wait, okay. this is. So we're doing the High West. <laughs> if you pour yeah. some whiskey, I love it. High West. Okay, and then, I and I'm, I'm, so, I'm so sorry I interrupted Elise, but like I said. That's all right. The conversation. For this, you can interrupt. <laughs> oh, right. I can Jonathan, I have yes. two old fashioned glasses and a snifter. So which, should I save the snifter for the cognac? I mean, you know, put it in a glass. It looks good in, man. Just, I've got Johnny's, uh, I'm going to put it in my go. Logo, logo. <laughs> okay, so, how much do you pour? About that much. I have a little tiny. <laughs> okay. Perfect. And so, do you sip it or do we do we do shots? Just, just no. Do whatever for now, and we'll come back to it because Elise had that question, and I didn't mm. mean to take us oh, off. I'm the... Sorry. Okay, so just no, take. No. A sip. Oh my goodness, yeah. that's good. So a, a month or so ago, you introduced me to this delightful wine, Bowen. If I hope yes. I'm saying that right. And uh, you perfect. said there was a really great story behind that. So would you like to share it with us? Absolutely. So uh, uh, um, Chuck Wagner, the guy that owns Camus Winery, mm -hmm. his son, Joe Wagner, uh, got, got into the family business and not at Camus, but started these wines, Bell Gloss, with Camus. And then from that, he created his own brand called Mayomi. And lo, these many years ago, he created mm -hmm. Mayomi with some contracts with various grape growers and grabbed a tiger by the tail and it took off and um, it became the most popular selling by the glass pour at restaurants around the country. It became the most popular selling wine at uh, grocery and convenience stores nationwide and independent liquor stores as well, club stores. In addition to that, it became a juggernaut. 
and uh, Mr. Wagner, Joe Wagner, uh, Joseph Wagner sold that brand to Constellation, but kept the contracts. And so the result was Constellation Brands um, bought some juice from Mr. Wagner and other places, but labeled it Naomi and sold it and people love it and it's delicious. But uh, Mr. Mr. Wagner outworked his contract, his no compete, and eventually used the same contracts to make a new wine called Foam. And what's really interesting about this particular wine is he's also, you know, Constellation wrote him a pretty big check. And so it costs a lot less than the quality. Uh, but the quality in the glass is much higher than mm -hmm. the, uh, the cost or expense of the wine. And he's added some RFID tech to it as well. So if you pull your phone up to a web app or not an app, I'm sorry, you don't even need that. When you open your browser, either Chrome or Google or something like that, and hold it on top of the bottle, it pulls you right to using the RFID tech, right to their website to give you some information. And this, this connection between tech and wine is something that a lot of people are beginning to lean on. And, and really he's leading one of several charges in, into this blending of technology with, um, at the retail side, technology and, and consumer um, advocacy and consumer connection. So it, it, it's a really interesting story and the wine is stupid good and super oh, yeah, popular yeah. and we sell a ton of it and we're just proud to be able to represent the brand and I've gotten the, had the good fortune to meet Mr. Wagner a couple of times. He really likes Little Rock. In fact, um, I don't remember the uh, event, but he did a nonprofit event remote um, in the last three months with a large nonprofit here in Little Rocks. Awesome. Maybe yeah. sometime he can come spend an evening with the chicks. I think that would be awfully fun. And that's it, real talk. That's right up his alleyway. That's exactly something that he would get interested in. Oh, that you would think be I could find it in Arizona, Jonathan? I feel like you could. I think if you went in and, and uh, to your local wine shop, I think you guys have like CVS and Total and whatnot out there. It's terrible. And I want to get into this in a minute. But it, it you know, the wonderful thing about being in Little Rock was I had you and, and people and and until you've shopped in his store, you, you, until you've lived somewhere like I have where the laws are different, you don't appreciate what a, a truly unique and special privilege it is to shop at somewhere like a Looney's. And I'm not saying that to blow smoke up your keister. I, I truly mean that. Um, out here, the laws are very different. And I'm, I'm, my choices are big box, right. like little wine, or you can go in any CVS, Target, grocery store, Sprouts, wherever, and buy limited selections of wine. But there's no, there's nowhere that you go and you have someone with your knowledge, or I haven't found. And so I've, I've struggled. You know, I reached out to you last summer. In fact, I was craving a white Pinot Noir and not to be found in Arizona. And of course, you yeah. had one. <laughs> so, um, you know, I can't remember what my question was. I, I, I went into my pity party that I can't shop with you and you can't send it to me. Well, it's certainly true that independent retail offers something to the guests that is very, very different than big box. I mean, when you, when you begin to use technology to type and cross your customer base and um, tell your customers what they're going to buy instead of offering your customers choice, um, it get, I mean, there's a really interesting discussion around that. Um, you know, there's more and more technology available to me to create um, basket adjacency. So if I sell X, then Y is something that my team gets prompted to recommend and things like that. And so there's a lot of new shortcuts in the biz. And I know that big box retail is really focused on turning dollars per square foot. I am too. Um, but I have a lot more latitude from an education perspective and a training perspective with my team because, you know, when in my little shop, when when I, when I buy, I buy all the wine, and so at the end of the day, when you walk in the door, even if I'm not there, and you go to the Pinot Noir rack, and you're like, I want to spend seventeen dollars on a Pinot Noir, there's four to choose from or six to choose from, and statistically, you're probably going to pick up one that you like, mm -hmm. maybe even better, one catches your eye because it's got a label that looks really cool to you. Well, you've been profiled by the wine company. And they picked you as a customer, and then I put it in my shop at the right price for you, and you pick it up. And so um, in a big box store that works as well, 
but there's less diversity of selection because a lot of times a winery will own multiple wines. In other words, let's talk Camus for a second. There's Camus, Camus Special Select, but they've also got Bonanza, which is a tier below. And then separate from that with their cap program, they've got Belle Gloss, which is a Pinot Noir program. And they got four wines from those guys. And so they got multiple tiers that target multiple customers. The result is, I just talked about 10 SKUs from one family, the Wagner Group. The result of that is when you start to explode that out for a big box store and they're trying to do you know, a real focus on taking the top 20% of brands out there that move 80% of the volume, they want those terms. And so they'll negotiate big deals and things like that. And that reduces diversity, selection, and choice. And you know, ultimately, I'm a huge independent store fan because I'm an independent store. But you know, even Whole Foods, um, they take 80% of their list and it's prescribed, and 20% they allot to the local, uh, the local wine person that works in the store. So even at Whole Foods or Central Market, um, not so much at CVS as I understand it, but certainly at like Goodies and uh, Seagulls and Specs and places like that, there are uh, people at the store at the unit level that get to choose some things. Mm -hmm. And so that does allow for some diversity, but I think independent retail is definitely the way to go and the place where you can find the most educated and most interested folks. I, and I'm, I want to say one thing we're going to go into, we're going to do a, a real fast 10 questions okay. with the sommelier, because I think they're the kind of questions that people want to ask and they don't, they don't want to ask them because they don't want to sound silly. Sure. But, but before that, I want to say I'm very happy about you being able to deliver during COVID. And I did see that the legislature introduced Senate Bill 32, yes. which has been amended and engrossed. But it looks like that you're going to be able to keep doing that even after the public health emergency ends. So it is it is my friend. it is my fervent hope that they say yes. The Senate already did. Uh, so we're waiting on the House to pull pull up a chair to the table and let it rip. We're going to all keep our fingers crossed. Okay, are you ready? Customers will demand it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let your we voice be right. Call your legislator, exactly. Okay, here we go. Then these aren't for big, big, long discussion, but here we go. <laughs> that was Rhonda saying, keep it short, Looney. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm working at, and also, is this whiskey supposed to make your chest burn a little bit? <laughs> yes. Okay, we're good then. Okay. Yes, it's it's so it's uh, if you look at the bottle, it says forty six percent alcohol by volume. Oh, and I don't hold my liquor worth a darn, so this could get interesting quickly. But yeah. okay, yeah. What are the big biggest faux pas that people tend to make when ordering and drinking wine? You can give us one or two. Worrying about the rules. Oh, that could be. All right, how should we taste wine when a sommelier pours a little bit into our glass for sampling? I always feel awkward when that happens. What are we supposed to do? I, th I think, um, uh, so Brene Brown speaking truth about being vulnerable is a really great space to live in with this interaction. It doesn't matter how fancy the restaurant, you don't have to be an expert. That's what the Psalm's there for. And their job is to create an amazing guest experience for you. So when they pour it in your glass, I say you look them dead in the eye and tell her, you know, I don't know what to do here. Teach me. And I, I tell you, nine times out of 10, probably 97% of the time, that psalm is going to say, I'm into this table. You will get better service. You will end up with better wine. And at the end of the day, that vulnerability and not trying to look like you know what's going on is something like we as psalms are wanting to teach. I mean, you've heard me tonight. I did, like, I want to talk. This is no, who that gravitates is, to it. And I love vulnerability. It's one of the things we talked about early on when starting this podcast. So yeah. I love that. And I do, I feel awkward when the, I'm the one, if they choose me to take that first sip and I'm just like, oh, I don't know what to do. Do I, right. scroll? Do I sniff it? Do I act like I know what I'm doing? <laughs> right. And I think that, I think that at table, you know, the, the reason a Psalm chooses the person to taste on the wine is because they either uh, chose the wine or they are seen at the table as being the person who is hosting the group. So that's, that's back a house. And that's how, that's why the person gets poured the taste. And in the dance, the, the person who ordered the wine and get, or the host gets the taste and would examine the wine to discover if it is good or what they wanted well i mean like 99.9 percent .9 of wine that you're going to get opened for you in a restaurant 
is going to be sound. It's going to be good. Well, that's my not, next question. You may, not, what if you, you may not love it, but at the end of the day, the wine is probably not flawed. It might be, probably not. So at the end of the day, the dance of, you know, smelling the cork or sipping the wine, I know it's not really necessary. What, what do you do if you don't like it or if, it, if you think something's off? I'm I would sticking, never do it, but I'm sticking with vulnerability. I think you should do it. And I think you should look them right in the eye and be like, wow, this is crap. I don't like this at all because the Psalm is there to enhance your experience at table and they win either way they go here. Right. At the end of the day, they look at the wine and they say, huh, well, you don't like it. Let's get you something you do like. What a win. Are you going to go back to that restaurant if they do that? Yes, because you were worried about what they might say, but their job is to host you and your guests, to make your experience second to none so that you are deeply invested and engaged in their success and going back to their store. They need you to come back in. And some snotty wine person telling you, well, that's just fine. I'm sorry you don't like it, but you're paying $500 for it. If I'm paying $500 for a wine, I damn well better love it. <laughs> and so at the end of the day, I don't think you stand on, on ceremony here. I think you just tell them straight and say, look, this Pinot Grigio that you're pouring me, that you helped me select is not my favorite. Don't choke it down. Why pay 20, 30, five, any money for mm -hmm. something you don't love? They're there to help you select something that enlivens conversation and deepens connection among your fellow mates at the table. Okay. Should you ever smell a cork? No. <laughs> okay. If you, Jonathan Looney, could only drink one wine for the rest of your life, what would it be? Champagne. <sighs> Which glass should you drink champagne from? Yes. Any glass. <laughs> Does it, it doesn't matter if it's the old fashioned, what's it called? A tulip, a bubble, what's it called? Yeah, so here's the thing about glassware, and I think this is a really important conversation that could devolve, but the short answer is it's bubbly. So get it out of the bottle so that it can effervesce and release some of the okay. you know, smells and flavors. Okay. But if it's bubbly and you're sharing it with somebody you love and care about, put it in a glass and let it rip. Let it rip. I've been known to drink bubbly from a solo cup. I've been known to drink from a pickle jar with a lid. I've been known to drink from tulip glasses, and I'll tell you that the tulip glass is the glass that's best to enhance the flavor, smells, and taste of a champagne. Excellent. Okay. Have you ever dropped or ruined a really expensive bottle of wine? I work in a business, literally, that is a glass house. So my entire store is full of bottles and stories about breaking them. <laughs> My favorite story is initially the door at my retail store. I had to adjust it because it, it wouldn't close all the way when it was a windy day. And so by adjusting it, it slammed a little bit, oh. which shook a wall that was connected to a wine rack. And I had this beautiful bottle of 2007 St. Francis Merlot, a three liter bottle sitting on top of this rack as a beautiful display. It wasn't for sale. It was a highly rated wine. I was really excited about drinking it someday in the future. The door slammed one day and the bottle came a tumbling. It took out a bottle of, uh, a bottle of Chateau Montalina Chardonnay, a bottle of Chalk Hill Chardonnay, a bottle of Rumbauer Chardonnay, and a bottle of one of my favorites, Farniente Chardonnay. And they all crashed to the floor and exploded in a beautiful explosion of glass and wine and tears and despair and I looked at my coworker Steve and I said I'm out and oh left. my gosh I can't yeah. even imagine oh and I was God. really lucky that Steve loved me enough that he cleaned it up but um, <laughs> uh, you will not I we used a product called wine away and you will not find that stain in the carpet but that was an epic 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 loss oh my goodness oh that makes me sad okay the most exquisite pairing of food and wine in the store or in so, the world. Sorry, there's I'm, a whiskey kicking in. I'm a pretty big fan. I've been to a, a couple of parties like this that it was all the bubbles you could drink because bubbles. And it was a bunch of different crew um, bubbles and a bunch of old stuff. 
and they did oysters with the bubbles and they did caviar with the bubbles. It was, oh. it was the theme of the party. It was a really fancy party. I'm not sure. I mean, I was just proud to be there. I'm not sure why they let me in, to be honest with you, but I drank my weight in bubbles that night and ate my ate my weight in caviar and and, uh, <laughs> oh, wow. and oysters. It was truly, truly extraordinary and a lot of fun. And I've I've been to that same party now three or four times, uh, three or four times. And the result of that has been um, that is my that's my pairing. That's the one I love. Excellent. What's an unusual pairing that works? You, unusual pairing. One of the most unusual that I got uh, chastised about was I had a bottle of Klein Big Break Zen 1997, and I paired it with uh, um, St. Andre cheese, which is a triple cream washed rind cheese. It's a little foxy, but it's super, it's like the closest you can get to eating actual butter, but it's cheese. And that is a totally non-traditional pairing, but the, well, the wine, if you imagine like brie, when they put chutney on it, like yes. a fruit chutney, mm -hmm. that's what it tasted like in my mouth. And so the oh, acid, wow, the acid good. from the wine cut through the, the thickness of the cheese and the fruit burst. And I got told by five or six people that that was a terrible pairing and they couldn't imagine why I would do that. And I thought, did they try it? <laughs> no, but they told me all about, you know, these were experts oh. and they told me all about how what I loved and what I liked was wrong. And uh, so here comes the uh, kind of classic part of everyday sommelier, which is drink what you love and love what you drink. And don't let somebody tell you you're wrong because you're not. If you like it, it smells good. It tastes good. It makes you feel good. Do it. Perfect. Last question. If you had to pick your last meal, food and drink, what would it be? Yeah, I, you know, at the end of the day, I, there's, I, I went to a tasting in Napa one time. We were at a winery that'll remain nameless and they did a, uh, what, what we would call down here crawfish boil, but they did it with lobsters. Oh. And so they came up to this huge picnic table that was covered in, covered in plastic. And they took an entire trash can of as big as my, a cubit large lobsters and dumped this huge trash can of lobsters across the table with, you know, all of the potatoes and the corn and just lobsters. And then, and then one at a time, we all got up from the table and went up to the large smoker where they had cold smoke, they cold smoked an entire tenderloin of beef. And you just held out your fingers for how thick you wanted to cut. And they cut it and then would kiss it on the grill on two sides to put grill marks on it. And it was perfectly rare, but perfectly done and smoky and delicious with, I don't even know what the, what the wood that they used to smoke it was, but cold smoked filet and lobster bake with all the Cabernet we could drink. And that's my last meal. And I would start out with champagne, of course. But like, <laughs> I love friends, that. You, well, have not, you have not lived till you've looked at five different five pound lobsters and said to yourself, that huge container of drawn butter, I could eat that whole thing with all these <laughs> lobsters and I won't have room for the steak, but I want to eat the steak and yeah, you can't eat it all. So that's, all. My, that's my last meal. Awesome. Well, Jonathan, let's do some whiskey. Walk us through this fun. And I'm going to sure. put my desk down because I'm tired of standing up. Okay. So the first the first up tonight is the uh, High West American Prairie uh, Bourbon. Uh, this is a product from the world's only ski, in, ski out whiskey distillery uh, in Park City, Utah. I love this uh, whiskey a lot. Um, it is a bourbon. So it is 51% corn in the mash bill. That's the... Uh, the, the stuff that they make the beer from that then they distill to make the whiskey. It's aged in an oak barrel and American oak, charred American, first use charred American oak. Um, and that's one of the couple of things that make it bourbon. Uh, this is a company owned by Co-Brand now. No, it's not. Oh goodness, I don't have my glasses. I don't know. If y'all can read the bottle, it's offered by these lovely humans and it's absolutely delicious. Now I put this in a glass, a tulip glass, and then I'm gonna nose the glass here, and then up here, and then down here after painting the interior of the glass with the whiskey. Um, with your glasses, do the same sort of thing. Give it a swirl. I breathe slightly into the glass, and then give it a sniff. Breathing into the glass will cause the volatile vapors to burn off, and so it won't burn your nosy nose. <laughs> and then you can smell the caramel, the biscotti, the almond, the apple, the pear, Lemon, 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 
bone rind, orange. But if you just stick your nose in the glass and sniff, it's going to burn because this again is a 46 proof or 46 percent alcohol product um, and 46 percent alcohol. Think of 50 percent alcohol, so half of the bottle was pure grain alcohol. So you can then give it a sip. So different, different from wine, you don't need to swirl it around the inside of your mouth. Different from wine, you don't necessarily need to um, mouthwash it, um, gurgle it, or anything like that, which you would do with wine, but you certainly wouldn't do that with, uh, with whiskey. Um, at the end of the day, um, what I like to tell people when they're tasting the whiskey is uh, breathe out, put it in your mouth. Don't breathe in, swallow it, and then breathe out and exhale. Um, and so the result of that is enhanced pleasure for what you're tasting, and it fills your head with smells and flavors. Say that one and more time. Breathe. Breathe in, sip the whiskey, swallow the whiskey, and then breathe out. And so Ooh. you won't experience any burn there. That right? makes a difference. And I didn't really expect it to. Okay. A lot of times people put it in their mouth and then breathe in and it catches their breath. And so this is why a lot of people don't really enjoy whiskey because they're not tasting it properly or drinking it properly. I will say and that they, made a difference. <laughs> yeah. And they either shoot it or mix it to decrease the, the way it shows up. And so, you know, I'm just a big fan of, uh, putting it together properly so that you can enjoy the, the experience. So okay. I'm a big fan of that. Um, nice. and the High West good. is, I think it's absolutely delicious. You can have a little sip of water. You can also dribble a little bit of water into it, um, a couple of drops. Um, you guys have a little bit more in your glass than I do. So maybe a little splash. And when you do that, you'll notice the serpents come up which is uh, as the water goes into suspension with the whiskey, you'll see little lines uh, show up in your glass mm -hmm. that also blends down the ABV. And what that does is when you smell it, it opens the smells up. It enhances, oh. uh, enhances the smell and it smells like a different product. So, um, you know, if you, if you, if you, <laughs> we're going to talk about scotch here in a minute. And I had a Scott tell me one time um, in the Scottish Brogue, you know, I spent 12 years getting the water out. Why would you put the water back in? And, uh, you know, with, with high proof spirits, I think putting a little water in them is not a bad thing. And it certainly, for me at least, enhances the enjoyment of it. But meant to be drunk neat, not over ice. So I'll challenge your, your conception of what mint is if you I like it. And it's way you enjoy it, then yes, um, a lot of people drink whiskey over ice, a lot of people drink it neat, and a lot of people mix it. And I'm not going to be didactic about how you should consume your whiskey, consume it the way you enjoy it. And as far as an education thing, we're doing it neat, and then with a little drop of water, because I think it, it shows you what the spirit, how, it, how the spirit really shows up. Um, and so you can think about, okay, well, this has really good caramel notes it might be really good with a splash of Coke. Or it might be really good just with club soda because I really like the vanilla that the barrel brings to this particular aging, aged whiskey, that kind of thing. Does that answer it? Yes. Cool, so that's number one. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on a brief pause. I'm gonna go get a glass so I can pour this out because I'm not gonna drink all three of these because it could be bad. <laughs> I did not know. So I don't know that I've ever really had whiskey much before tonight, but I will say it made a huge difference drinking it. Like he said, breathing in, taking the sip and breathing out. I didn't expect that to be the case, but I agree. I really like scotch. Yeah. Yeah. In my misspent youth, I drank a lot of it. I like it best when you drop a hard peppermint in the bottom and let it dissolve. Oh, that's fun. I think what, you know, what's interesting is uh, clients come to us. It's funny. They've, they've been on bourbon or Canadian whiskey or uh, Irish whiskey or something for a while. And they come to us and they say, I want to get into scotch. Mm -hmm. And so after a little bit of like back and forth and conversation, we quickly discover they're tired of buying bourbon that their friends come over and drink. 
And so they get into scotch to prevent their friends from drinking their whiskey. So, Interesting. Yeah. So what's fun here is after the glass is empty, get, give it a smell. And so you, you guys have multiple glasses in front of you. But as you finish consuming the whiskey in one glass, and I'm going to use the same glass for all of these. But as you finish consuming the whiskey in each glass, it'll be curious to discover the smells that remain in the glass. Because remember, glass is just liquid in solid state. And so it's porous. And so all those little holes the whiskey gets into and um, the process of um, oxidation or rusting, um, this oxidative process releases volatile organic compounds. That's the smells, right? So at the end of the day, there's more smell in the glass when there's less liquid in the glass. Okay. And so that's kind of a fun thing to make note of um, when, you're, when you're tasting and evaluating a whiskey. Okay, cool. So next up is the uh, Hennessy uh, VS, very special cognac. This is an H product from France. This is cognac um, from France. Cognac is a demarcated area and the EU has a lot to say about um, whether or not you can call your whiskey a cognac or not. So uh, cognac is made from uh, Uni Blanc, which is a grape. Um, Uni Blanc in France is called Trebbiano in Italy. So they make a grape uh, wine essentially, and then they distill that wine. And then this is aged in oak barrels. And these are French oak barrels in this case. And so this whiskey has a very different smell. It's smoother smelling, less rough. Darker. Around. Is it darker? It's, darker. It's, it's less rough around the edges. Um, the minimum age in these first two whiskeys is about four years. Um, and so this is also a whiskey because it's a fermented product that, that then is put into a barrel and aged, but instead of being 51% corn in the balance, other grains, this is all grapes. So um, oh. I think it has a smoother smell, although it is not necessarily a smoother product. Um, the Moet Hennessy rep came to Arkansas a couple of years ago, and I was fortunate to be at the tasting where she poured VS, VSOP, XO, XXO, and two other products that are crazy expensive, like $7,000 a bottle. And um, they, it's just extraordinary the diversity that takes place after putting a spirit in a barrel and aging it for a period of time. Um, Hennessy is a cognac I prefer of all the cognacs. There's a couple other brands that are difficult to get around here, but uh, this guy is a tried and true workhorse. Um, it is a huge brand. It is growing by leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, uh, there's an excise tax on it right now that makes it too expensive, um, but it's still worth every penny. So um, this one is smooth and caramely as well. I get a little bit of lemon zest, a little bit of lime, which is kind of interesting and unexpected. Might just be my glass, might not. <laughs> I definitely get vanilla and vanilla, vanillin and vanilla bean, um, like the whole pod, the outside of the bean, not just the vanilla stripped out. Um, and also to like, I like um, this. <laughs> there's a rummy note to it, which is kind of weird and funky and interesting where it's like, yeah. um, do you ever, okay, here's Arkansas, right? Do you ever go see sorghum being made? Uh -uh. Molasses where they take the sorghum in and they put it in the trough and they cook it with a big fire underneath. I've, this I've seen got, it a lot with maple so this, syrup. Yeah, so this has got a really cool like, the sorghum? Weirdly sorghum note to it, which again, it's probably just my nose. Yeah, it smells lovely. And this this guy is what, oh good Lord, does somebody have their glasses on? I can't see this. 40% alcohol. So remember that it comes out of the still at still strength, which is like 180, 190 proof. And then they put it into a barrel and age it. And so the, it goes into the barrel high proof and then it proofs down in the barrel. The angel share happens so as the barrel breathes, as the liquid moves into the pores of the barrel and evaporates out, out outside of the barrel, the rickhouse, of course, smells fantastic, but um, the ABV goes down, the intensity of flavors increase, the angels get their 130 year share. And at the end of the day, they end up with a pretty high proof product. This is why the uh, American Prairie from High West is so high in alcohol, 46, but they proof it down. And so they stretch the batch and uh, add water to bring it down to 40% AB or 40% um, alcohol or 80 proof. And so when you begin to look at whiskeys, um, a lot like wines, 
one has to be careful and aware of the economic situation in so much as while these bottles all may be the same size for you to consume each one of them completely and compare the effects, the effect of one would be different than the effect of another. So curiously, I have guests that come in and say, oh, I only drink red wine and I only drink Malbec. And I tried a Cabernet the other day and I got an extreme headache, so I'm allergic to Cabernet. Well, no, the Cabernet was 15.5% alcohol and you drank the whole bottle and you weren't particularly hydrated. And when you drink Malbec, it's 18% alcohol and you drink the whole bottle and you've gotten done with your workout after you've had a full day of drinking your three and a half, four liters of water. And so the effect is very different and the hangover, if you get one, is different. And so be aware of the alcohol content in the package because it has a dramatic effect on A, your enjoyment, but B, you know, how much or how little you can enjoy. Um, and, and I think that's probably the reason this smells a little bit smoother to me is that it is less alcohol, right? So 6% less alcohol and that's, that's substantial. It, it's very nice. It's mm -hmm. very nice. Okay, yeah. what's the third one? Third one is Glenlivet 12 year. So this is a single malt scotch from uh, Scotland. This is a Highland. Uh, it is uh, double oak, they say. So it's aged in cherry casks and probably American oak, but I didn't study in advance. So they'll bend my sommelier card. Um, it's a 12 year uh, product. So in this case, the youngest whiskey in the glass, uh, in the barrel, in the bottle is gonna be 12 years old. So that's so what that's, the number means. In this case, it says 12 years old on the label. So oftentimes you'll see numbers on labels and they don't always mean that's the age statement, but in this case, it is. I once bought from you a Macallan oh. 25. Ooh, that, yeah. You remember that? I remember the whiskey. I don't remember you buying it, but thank you. It was, yeah, it was a Christmas gift for someone, but was, was that, did that mean 25 years? Or? It did. It meant the youngest whiskey in the, in the barrel was 20, or in the blend was 25 okay. years old. And that's an exceptional, exceptional bottle of whiskey. That's what you told me. <laughs> yeah. So exceptional that six bottles came to Arkansas this calendar. Oh, my. Oh, wow. I oh. love the way this smells. Yeah, it smells like honey. Yes. It does smell like honey. Honey and, yes. and lemon. and. So I love tasting with women. And so what's interesting and curious about this is, you know, regardless of how it happens, Women know uh, divert. Um, um, women learn from a very young age how to see, smell, taste differences in things that a lot of guys aren't expected to ever. So I love like wine tasting specifically because at the end of the day, you guys are going to smell things that I might not, and I'm front and loading the conversation by telling you what you're going to smell. But if we were just to have an open conversation where I wasn't teaching talking you guys would be smelling things in this whiskey that i i couldn't and then once you told me that you smelled it i would and so i was really lucky with my sommelier class it was like 90 percent women and so i was really surrounded by greatness because they were able to differentiate things and smells and flavors and and tastes that i wasn't and so i eventually uh involved myself with a neti pot and was able to clear my sinus and was able to finally smell the things you know, when, when somebody looks at you and is like, this smells like potting soil, and you're like, what? And then, you know, you end up at the Good Earth Garden Center making small tears in the bags and trying to smell the oh potting soil gosh. to discover what the smell is like, right? Or, you know, this smells like old apple. Well, okay, so you buy an apple and leave it on the counter for about three weeks after cutting a couple holes in it, and then you get your nose in there and smell it. So, you know, there, there's lots of things that I didn't understand at first that the women at my sommelier classes were able to teach me and had, you know, they were generous of spirit enough to do so. Um, but, you know, when I was, when I first started those classes, it was like, that smells like wine. Wow. That smells wow. like red wine. Mm -hmm. And like, really, if we put it in a black glass and you put red, white, and pink in front of you, most people wouldn't be able to suss out the differences. I, of, of the three whiskeys, I like this second best. I like Hennessy first best. 
and I like the high west third best. And I'm the same. Now this one did burn me a little bit, and I tried yeah, to sneak. So this is going to be a little higher alcohol, and I can't again can't see that. But mm -hmm. if I'm a betting man, it's 43 percent alcohol. Where is that going to be on the label? So on the oh, label, 40 percent. It's 40 percent. It's like the Hennessy. Oh, is it? Okay, mm -hmm. great. Yeah, but I. I, it did burn more than the Hennessy for me. Oh, that's interesting because the High West was the one that I got more of a burn out of. Is it not the High? Oh, the Hennessy? The no, High West the was West. the most alcohol, right? The highest? Yeah, the High West had the most. Yeah, I got the most um, burn there too. But the trick little, but... you told us about holding in your breath, swallow, and then breathing out made all the difference in the world. About yeah, and when you when you breathe out with your mouth different than your nose right yeah. because you're putting that that those smells differently into your olfactory bulb oh that's then, what happened i breathed out with my nose yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Gone. it's gone when i breathed out with my mouth sorry right. can you know don't be sorry like, what's what's fun about this is like that exploration around you know how your biology affects your enjoyment for yeah. the product that you're tasting so it's often curious when I talk to clients about, you know, what they like and don't like, because um, a lot of times it's a time and place thing. And sometimes it's, you know, who you were with and sometimes it's, you know, what your mood was and sometimes, you know, so all these things play a factor in, you know, how we enjoy the, the spirits and the wine that we approach. So I hope I've taught you as a little something. And if, 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 you know, if, 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 if not a little something, at least how to drink the whiskey and not like oh, freak out and like fill your head with burningness, right? This is amazing. You no, know, that's the whole thing. I, I I feel like I actually learned a heck of a lot tonight. You can come hang out with the chicks anytime you anytime. want. <laughs> anytime. Anytime. Sounds like hey, opportunity for up, regular then, booking. Right before we wrap up, Jonathan, um, oh, sure. what's on the horizon for you for the next five to 10 years? What, what is oh, the good like? Lord. I, I've got a 10 year old and a seven year old. I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so at the end of the day, um, we have created, spent the last year or so creating some processes. And so I'm working on a couple of interesting and unique products. Um, uh, I want to get into winemaking a little bit. I think that would be something kind of fun. And uh, I want to get into having my own brand um, around wine. And I think that'll be something interesting. And whether it's, you know, because I have multiple stores and then I have a place to sell that wine or because one of my friends that works out West and makes wine needs help one summer and, and I can go help him or her prep the area and I can be, you know, tough labor, you know, punch down over, you know, punch this wine down in the vat every two hours all night long. Well, okay. And I'm just pushing the, pushing the, the skin cap down. Um, so, you know, I, I'm really lucky with, with young kids because it keeps me young. And so at the end of the day, I'm going to be able to look up in five or 10 years and have developed deep and um, resonating relationships with more people in the trade. And those will serve me better and more then. Um, so it's a, some bit of winemaking and some dabbling in other retail stores and maybe a computer program or two. And, you know, we'll just see where life takes us because life is what happens when you're making other plans, right? Right. That's awesome. Yeah. What so a great good. philosophy. So, so how can people find you? And you mentioned social media before, so. Yeah, so you can find us at Olunis or at Olunis or at Olunis on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Uh, you can also find us at Olunis on LinkedIn and me at Jonathan G. Looney uh, on LinkedIn. And uh, certainly you can check us out on our website, www.olunis.com. That's O, my last name, Looney, and an S plural, olunis.com. And uh you know, we're, we're not doing a blog right now, so there's no real action happening on that. I do a lot of direct consumer email, but I don't flood your inbox with offers and sales and things like that. Although I'll probably increase that a little bit because real talk, I'm getting, because of COVID and because restaurants are closed, there is a dearth of product out there that never came to retail in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I'm seeing more and more availability around things that I love and can offer to my clients. I just last month, or yes, right in December, I sent a text to my Kermit Lynch rep and was like, hey, can I get Quintarelli? A really fancy Italian, amazing beautifulness. And, uh, you know, Arkansas has never had an allocation. 
and they allocated three cases to me and I got the state's allocation and I had these three cases of lovely delicious stuff that I've only seen in the wild two times in all my travels and so you know it, both times I bought the wine because buying the wine um, and it's terrifyingly expensive especially at restaurants but I'm fortunate to have some at holiday in my little shop and turn some people on to it and you know that's the kind of cool stuff I love doing. Well, That's I know lovely. with your with your wine club, I've experienced new wines, and I've actually shared them with friends, and they buy yeah. it now. So, I mean, it's just I think that's so amazing. So, Arkansas is first, and we'll yes. put all of the information in our show notes. Okay, too. right, Ron. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we'll put at, we'll put all your links in the show notes, and we'll also put um, the names of what we tasted tonight, so Perfect. other people can go to Aluni's, get what we were drinking, and enjoy for themselves because this was. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Thank you, Jonathan. Jonathan, thank Bye. you. Cheers. Be well. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening. And please continue to send us your comments and questions. We didn't get a chance to get to those today, but we certainly will on the next episode. And speaking of the next episode, we're going to talk about going gray with sass, right, Rhonda? So I, I may look a little different next time yeah. you guys see me. So tune in for that. That's going to be a great episode. And just like the legit chicks, we hope you're always keeping it legit. Till next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Legit Chicks Podcast, available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you get your podcasts. If you enjoyed being part of the fun, please subscribe, rate, review, and share with your friends. Visit our webpage at www.legitchicks.com to send us your comments and suggestions for episodes.